Words are important. And that concludes our sermon for today. I'm not going to lie, the chapel service actually broke out in applause. That is a 100% true fact. One middle schooler came up to me afterward and said he had prayed that the sermon would be shorter, and he thought it was an answer to prayer. I was sad to disappoint him. No, words are important. They matter a whole, whole lot. We put a lot of emphasis on words. You can break somebody's spirit with an ill-timed word or a very intentional word. You can lift somebody out of the dregs of sorrow with a right word. Words are powerful. We know this. It makes sense. All of creation was brought into existence by God speaking. It makes sense that his image bearers in some way have power in the words that they say. We emphasize words. We make a a big deal out of words. One of the things we talk about when we talk about children was what were the first words they uttered? What did this baby say? Make a big deal out of last words too. What was the last thing this person uttered? Some reason we add significance to it. I'm always afraid that like the last thing I'm going to say to my kids before they go off to school is like, put on your shoes, we're in a hurry. And then like something's going to happen to me and they're going to to be like, yeah, I remember. They're going to stand by the casket tearfully and be like, I remember when dad said for me to put my shoes on. Daddy, I'll never take them off again. You want something significant, right, for your last words. Words are important. They matter. Many of us in this room wish that somebody would say something life-giving to us. Some of us have struggles in our life because the people who were supposed to speak life-giving words to us never did. They remained silent or they abused that privilege and power and spoke death into our lives. So today we're going to talk about this need that we have to both deliver and receive life-giving words. How do we have words that cause other people to flourish? We're in Ephesians 4, uh, 25 to 32. We've read this earlier in our service. How do we have life-giving speech? Three ways to have life-giving speech. The first is to speak with integrity. We speak with integrity. Look at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for you are members of one another. Stop right there. Paul has already told us in 417 that we're not supposed to live as the Gentiles do, the pagans, the people that don't follow Christ. We're not supposed to live like they live. And the reason we're not supposed to live like they live is told us later in the passage, but before we get to 425, he says, you take off the old self, you put on the new self, you're a new creation, you've been made into something new. And because you've been made into something new, you live in a different way. And so 425 to 32, and really the rest of it is, this is how we're going to live differently. This is how we're going to show we have, we're new creations. And the primary way we do this, at least initially, is how we speak. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus himself says, out of the heart the mouth speaks. So whatever's in your heart is going to come up out of your mouth. So if you want a good spiritual inventory, how am I doing with the Lord? How am I growing spiritually? What is it? What is my walking in faith look like? Analyze your words. What do you say? And not just what comes out of your mouth. What do you have to keep yourself from saying? What do you really want to say? But it's not socially acceptable or it's not worth it at the time. Or it's not okay to say. What do you tell yourself? We need to be people of integrity. It's not just what comes out of our mouth. It's what we want to have come out of our mouth. And there are two threats that are talked about in verse 25 and verse 28 that are threats to our integrity. And the first is our tendency to deceive. Deception. Deception. Look again at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, deception, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. This taking off and putting on is is the Greek term for putting on and putting off clothing. It's putting on a garment. And so many of us wear deception like a garment. It's one we've carefully woven together to let the world around us think something differently about us than is true. 
And I know we're talking about speaking, but again, so many uh, uh, experts say that communication is what, 70 to 90% nonverbal. I can deceive you without ever saying anything about it. So speaking isn't just what comes out of our mouths. It's the way we communicate with the world. We've woven together a carefully constructed garment of lies to convince the world about ourselves something that's not true. How many of us use a flashy personality or or humor to distract from the fact that we don't know what we're doing? I sometimes feel like I'm making a career out of that. The more nervous I get, the more jokes I tell. So if you want to know if you've got me on the ropes, watch the jokes. It's true. We try to distract. We hope to look professional with people. We give the appearance that we know what we're doing, what we're talking about, so we dress a certain way, we use certain words like synergy to act more professional. Our social media accounts are galleries of deception. Everybody has the best life ever on social media. Oh, but we can live up to our social media lives. Be nice. And those are active attempts at deception. And you know what's really bad about those? They're socially acceptable. Nobody is going to fault you for trying to convince the world that you're funny or that you have it all together. Nobody's going to fault you for a carefully curated social media account. Nobody's going to, going to ding you for trying to be more professional. They're all socially acceptable. But it's not just active attempts at deception. It's also uh, passive attempts at deception. We do it without even thinking. How many of you have ever sat and listened to somebody talk, and you're sitting across the table, you're making eye contact, and you were thinking about something altogether different? You are not hearing a one word that person is saying. You're nodding your head, you're smiling. The classic, uh uh-huh, yeah, totally. Go on. Oh, that's crazy. I don't know what this person's talking about. I'm thinking about dinner. It's deception. You are convincing the person of a reality that's not true. That's a lack of integrity. Our deceit runs remarkably deep. We are hopelessly dishonest people. We think our deceptions are small. We tell little white lies. If only we would just tell little white lies. We are deceptive people. Some of you aren't even listening right now. But I appreciate you not falling asleep. Some of us on Sunday mornings, we come here, we sing a whole bunch of words. We have no idea what we're singing. Not paying attention to them at all. Thinking about something else. We bow our heads when it's appropriate time to pray, and the people around us think we're praying. But we're not conversing with the Lord at all. We're not listening to the words that are being prayed and thinking, I hope that those words echo the, the reflection of my heart. No. Some of us just took the Lord's Supper without a single thought towards our Savior. It's deception. We're trying to convince the people around us that we are more righteous than we are. Deception is a challenge to our integrity, but it's also gain. Trying to earn something, trying to gain something. Look at verse 28. is a challenge to our integrity. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, I'm taking a little bit of a liberty here. Obviously, stealing is not speaking. But it's in this same passage because our series is talking about one another. That's what we're focusing on. This is today we're talking about speaking with one another. And Paul is including stealing in here because stealing is a threat to the community. It's a threat to the one anotherness of the church. If you're stealing from the people you worship with, that's a threat to community. It's a threat to trust. I imagine we find ourselves tempted to steal more often than we realize. Because we think of stealing as taking a physical object. You can steal all sorts of stuff. And usually it's deception is the way that we get it. Do you tell your your employers that you're farther along on a project than you actually are? Maybe an exaggeration of how far you've come. How many times do you uh, tell customers that a product or a service can do just a little bit more 
than what you know it can do so you'll get a sale. How many times do we loop customers into terms of service agreements knowing full well that they explicitly deny a service that that person's probably hoping to have? And you know they're never going to read it until they need it. How many times do we take long lunches? How many times do we spend way too much time on our phone at work? We're stealing. We're stealing. We're stealing people's trust, stealing people's time. And if that's only at work, imagine how much we steal at home or at church. How much attention do we steal from the Lord in worship when we're here at church? How much... How many arguments have you stolen from someone you live with, whether it's a spouse or a kid, by using guilt, a roommate? You leverage guilt as a way of stealing an argument. You know you're in the wrong, but you're going to make somebody feel bad about it. There's no way around it. We are liars and we are thieves. And there's no way to clean that up. There's no way to make that sound better. We need to face it. And then look at what scripture says to do with it. Because in each of the verses, 25 and 28, we're told to replace that behavior with something else. In 25, we're told to speak truth with our neighbor. This can look like a lot of things. But let's talk about specifically here in church. What if, what if when somebody comes up to you at church, the typical thing to say is, hey man, how's your week? And we respond with almost a a catechetical response, good, fine, going great. We might even spice it up a little bit with something like blowing and going, you know? You clever, clever wordsmiths, you. Your world can be falling apart around you. And you'll smile and say, fine. And what's worse is the person asking, how was your week, has zero intention of knowing what your week was like. They're just greeting you. But real integrity in a church would be a person responding to that question and saying, you know what? Things are going pretty rough for me. And you might not be able to share everything. You might not want to throw all of your your laundry out in the street like that. I get that. But you can even say, in integrity, you know what, I really can't talk about it. I don't want to to put anything on this. I don't want to burden anybody. You can have integrity in saying, not everything's great. I don't necessarily want to get into all the details, but I would appreciate your prayers. And then the person who asks the question, hey, how was your week? Integrity says, guess what? I really want to know how things are going. Not to gossip, but as much as you're willing to tell me, I want to listen. What if we sat outside the service and talked about this? Or what if we skipped our connect group? We'll let our connect group leader know. Sunday school teacher know we're there. We've got to check that role. That's fine. But we're going to sit outside and talk for a little bit. I just want to hear how things are going. You can tell me as much or as little as you want to. That is a church of integrity. That's a conversation with integrity. Maybe it's confronting somebody who's hurt you. Hey, I just wanted you to know, like, you said this or you did this. You probably didn't mean it the way you meant it, but it kind of cut me. And I just, I'd like to reconcile because I've been holding it against you for the week and it's just not right. And then the person that receives that says, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. I so didn't mean it that way. I'm really sorry. Or, hey, you know what? I was having a bad week and you were the first person I had a chance to take it out on and I took it out on you. I'm really sorry. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, Travis, that sounds really messy. Guess what it is? We lie because we think it's easier. It's cleaner. And all the while, we're dirtying each other up with our lies and our deceptions. Be forthright with the people in your home. Moms, dads, grandparents. Stop acting like you have it all together. And here's why. You're doing a disservice to your kids and your grandkids because we sit there and we look at you and we think, what's wrong with me? I'm struggling so hard and mom and dad seem like they've never had a problem in their life. You're not helping anybody by acting that way. Let your kids know the things you struggle with, the challenges you have. Grandparents, share the times when you were uncertain in your life. Kids, share your struggles with your parents. In most circumstances, and again, parents, receive that well. Get mad later. We'll talk about anger in a bit. And kids, if there's that rare circumstance where you're like, I don't really know how I'm going to talk to my folks about this, that's why we have a staff of next-gen pastors here for you to talk to. And honestly, growing up, I wish I had the people that you guys have. I wish I had the Christinas and the Taylors and the Nathans and the TJs and the Shelbys. 
to talk to. Be honest when you're going through mental health struggles. Be honest uh, about things. Look, we've moved out of the era where church is cool. And what I mean by that is back in the day, you might go to church to get ahead. Like, like you might have a job opportunity. It looks good on a resume. So and so is a member of this church or they're a deacon at this church. We're out of that era. Being a member or not a member of a church has zero bearing usually on your success in life. So if we're not worried about that anymore, can we please just start being honest with one another? Start being open. Again, it doesn't mean you have to wear all your problems on your t-shirt. But you can at least be honest with a few. In 428, it tells the person who steals to have something to offer. The person who steals is selfish. And usually they're, they're chronically deceiving. There's very rare to find an honest thief. There's a reason why Robin Hood is a legend. There's no such thing as an honest thief. And again, we don't often steal physical things. Maybe you do. But usually what we steal in our environment is attention. We steal affection. We steal product loyalty, promotions. We steal wins in an argument. And what Paul is saying here by saying, the person who steals, if you're a good thief, you're talented. Usually you're creative. I've seen all the Oceans movie. I know how creative those things are. Okay? And what Paul is saying here, if you're that good, if you're that creative, use your creativity, use your skills for the good of the community instead of taking it away. And so if you find yourself having stolen, it's time to put those skills to good use. If you're somebody who's stolen affection, then that means you're good at getting people's, you're good at, you know what love is, you know how important love is, you know how important affection is. Use that in other people's lives to bless them, love on other people, encourage them, tell people the words you wish you would hear. Build them up. If you've stolen attention, you know how critical it is to be praised, to be encouraged, and praise, praise other people, lift them up, call attention to them. If you've stolen customers from other businesses on purpose, confess and repent. If you've stolen a promotion, commend your rivals. If you've stolen arguments through underhanded means, shouting people down, guilt, again, say you're sorry. Let people know what your tricks are so they can call you out on it. Work diligently to undo the damage that has been done. When Zacchaeus meets the Lord, what does he say? After Jesus says salvation has come to this house, it's because Zacchaeus has said, if I've stolen anything, I'm going to give it back fourfold. Making restitution is sometimes hard and it's expensive, but it's worth it. And the reason why we do this is because of who our Savior is. We are people of integrity because Jesus is the greatest person of integrity. He didn't just not tell lies. He is the truth. He didn't just not steal. He gave everything for us. And we do this. We live lives of radical integrity to tell the world about our Savior. That's why it's so critical for us to be this way with one another. But it's not just enough that we, we don't deceive, that we have integrity. We also have to have purity. We need to speak with purity. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Paul becomes concerned not just with integrity, but in wholesomeness of talk. And are usually, again, thinking about this when I, when I read this in high school, usually it's, it's about coarse joking or dirty joking. Don't tell dirty jokes. That's a radically narrow view of this passage. He's talking about much more than just off-color humor. The word unwholesome there, corrupting, actually is the word for rotten. It's the same word that's used to describe food that goes bad. What the scriptures are telling us here is when you speak, don't serve rotten food. Don't give rotten, a rotten plate out to people to consume. Imagine you have friends over to eat and you're going to cook them a nice meal. So you're going to give them the finest choices of, choices of meat, the freshest vegetables and fruits, the finest dessert you can think of. And then think about how upset you would be 
to know that they went home that night and got sick because of the food that you made. Because it was undercooked. Now imagine if they got sick, not just because you made a mistake, but because you were careless with the way you prepared it. Or you were un, uncaring. Maybe you even thought to yourself, eh, these vegetables aren't the best, but they're probably okay. This milk's only like a week out of date. I'll, I'll put it in this. I don't really need to wash my hands. It's fine. And as revolting as all of that sounds, and it is, that is what Paul is describing here in this passage. That's the kind of talk that we serve up to our neighbors and friends that makes them sick, that makes them spiritually sick. Let me ask you this. If there was a health inspector that went around and gave out letter grades on the restaurant that is our heart and mouths and what we serve out of our speech, what would your letter grade be? And if people knew your letter grade, if you had to wear it on your shirt, would anybody want to have a conversation with you? I don't know that people would want to talk to me very much. And what happens next kind of seems like a non sequitur. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our tendency is to take that verse and be like, oh, just don't sin. It makes God sad. It really takes the teeth out of the passage. Of course we shouldn't sin, and of course it makes God sad. But think about the context of the passage. We're talking about one another. What he's saying here is that what grieves the Holy Spirit is when we take actions that disrupt the community that damage the community, specifically with the words that come out of our mouth, with how we speak to one another. When we injure the community through deceit, anger, theft, unwholesome talk. So how does that affect the way you speak? Well, when we think of God, we often throw out God as love, right? And usually we attach love to the Father, we attach love to the Son in the Trinity, but we rarely talk about the Holy Spirit loving us, despite the fact that He's fully God, and we know that God is love. We rarely talk about the Spirit of God as loving, and I don't know why that is. My guess is we have a hard time getting our head around the Spirit being a person. It's probably a weakness in our Trinitarianism. Not in the doctrine, but in our understanding of it and appreciation of it. And I think this is why Paul tells us here in verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of God is the one. He is the person who keeps us in the faith. He is the one who makes sure that we make it from the moment of our baptism all the way through to the end of our life. He is the one that secures us and empowers us and is a seal for us. We don't get by by our own strength. We don't get by by our own power. You don't white knuckle it until you see the gates of heaven. The Holy Spirit of God empowers you, and he does this because he loves you. He's like the mother hen with, her, with his wings over us, sheltering us, and guiding us. And he does it because he loves us. And so when you think about grieving him, you're grieving someone who cares for us. And when you're damaging the community, you're grieving him because you're hurting other people that he loves, that he secures. And so we need to speak in such a way that brings flourishing. In 1993, Jack in the Box had an E. coli uh, uh, outbreak. It was in the Pacific Northwest. 70 people got sick. Four people died, all of them children. And it was because E. coli was in the burgers and they weren't cooked right. But it was also the supplier. The supplier had a problem as well. They had E. coli in their, in their meat. So naturally, you would hope that Jack in the Box would change the supplier. And that is our solution for the words that go on in our heart and come out of our mouth. You need to change your supplier. You need to change where you get your words from. It's not just kids that learn to talk from what they hear and see. It's us too. It's adults. I hear so many people say, oh, well, the language in movies and TV doesn't bother me. It should. It should. We should have sensitive hearts to that because what you hear, if you hear enough of it, you'll mimic. You need to change your supplier. 
Go to the Holy Spirit. Spend time with Him. This is why we do the dwell readings every single day. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, Travis, are you telling me that for every 30 minutes of TV I watch, I've got to spend 30 minutes in the Bible? That doesn't sound very realistic. Of course I'm not telling you to do that. Because it is unrealistic. Here's what I'm telling you. You need to have a balanced diet. You need to have a balanced diet. You can't just eat junk food all the time. And you can't just watch the same things, listen to the same things all the time. You have to have a balanced diet. So this means when you spend time in God's word, whether you spend five minutes or 30 minutes or whatever you spend, you carry that message with you for the rest of the day. So then when you start to hear everything else, it's like uh, my kids, we pack snacks for my kids during the day at school. You pull out your snack. You're like, oh, I'm, 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 I'm having an opportunity to consume somebody's words. It's gossip or it's hate or it's off-colored language or whatever. I'm going to pull out what I heard from God today and, oh, this is going to nourish me. I'm not going to respond to that. I'm not going to join in that gossip because that's not what the Spirit of God has taught me to do. I'm not going to participate in that joke because it's not what the Spirit of God has told me to do. I really want to say this cutting, sarcastic remark. And God, please change my heart towards that person. You go back again and again. It's not just how much you read. It's how much you read that transforms you, that changes you. That's what it is. It's a balanced diet. Oftentimes we speak, and when we speak, we speak in ways that we're trying to cover up our ignorance. When we don't know something, we get insecure, and one of the ways we cover up our ignorance is we, get, we, we yell, right? We get louder. <laughs> if I'm loud, people won't see how much I don't know about this. Uh, again, we use humor. And one of the things that people are yelling about right now is the war that's going on in the Middle East. And there's a lot of talk around that, a lot of talk. And it's really easy to get sucked in. It's really easy to have conversations about things that you think you know, or maybe you really do know a lot. I would encourage you as a way of kind of balancing out your diet. Jeff on Wednesday is having his pastor study, as he always does, on Wednesday night. And specifically, he's going to be talking about Israel and Hamas and Gaza and all of that going on. And so I would encourage you, if you want to know more, if you want to be able to speak a little bit more about it in a way that, that may be covered, that's truthful, full of integrity and wholesome, I would encourage you to attend. It could be a good way, a good step to begin to change your suppliers trusted voice, friend like Jeff. So it's important for us to have integrity when we speak. It's important for us to have purity when we speak, but it's also important for us to have grace when we speak. Look at verse 26. We'll read 26 and 27 and then skip down to 31. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We'll jump back into to 26 in a minute, but notice they both talk about anger and they seem to do it in different ways. Verse 31 talks about anger in the ways that we think about anger. Anger is not a good emotion. It's not healthy. It's destructive. And he says it. He says, let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Get rid of malice. That makes sense to us. It's the same taking off language that we talked about before. But then you go back to 26, and what does he say? He says, be angry and do not sin. Friends, that's a command. God is telling you, be angry. And sometimes we try to, try to write that off. Be like, oh, well, he's talking about, it's, it's like a conditional. It's like, if you are angry. We supply the if. Grammatically, that doesn't hold up. I'm not a Greek grammarian, but I took a class from a guy that is, and he wrote the book on Greek grammar, and he has an entire part of that book where he's like, this doesn't work. The command stands, be angry and do not sin. So what do you do? What do you do when you couple this with what's said in verse 31? What do we do? Because it's saying, do not let the sun go down on your anger. When you talk about the words that are used in 31 with do not let the sun go down on your anger, I think it means don't sit in your anger. Don't stay angry. Look at the words in 31. Bitterness, wrath, clamor, slander, anger, 
malice. Those are long-term, a lot of those are long-term words of being angry. I think the command in 26, when he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, I think what he's really saying is, be angry and do something about it. Be angry and do something about it. When you get mad, when you get your feelings hurt, do something about it. We have been given anger. Anger is an emotion we've been given, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But right now we need to understand that God gets angry. Jesus got angry. He flipped tables. That's not even socially acceptable in our day. We're called to take something off and put something on. Notice what's being taken off and put on. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. We're going to talk about forgiveness next week. We're going to look at those same verses. 30 to 32 next week. And so I'm going to kind of move forward here. But we need to have a resolution to our anger. A lot of times we think forgiveness or being kind is just blowing it off and acting like nothing happened. That's not how you handle anger. It's not how you address it. Most of us think that anger is not something we're allowed to have. But anger is important. First, you need to direct it at something or you will direct it at someone. How many of us have been angry about something that's happened at work and we came home and took it out on the people we live with? That's a regular occurrence. We need to find ways to direct our anger. One of the things that makes me angry is when I see kids being hurt. When I read about it in a news story or I get the Amber Alert coming over, I don't know what it is about it. Just have a really soft spot for kids. And so when I see that Amber Alert come up, it's a notification for me to pray. As much as I'd love to, to go track down the person and, and, and go find and rescue that kid, I want to do that. I pray for the kid. I pray for the person. It's a notification to pray. You see, anger is like an alarm bell going off. It's a sign that we need to do something about something. My, uh, I talked to my counselor this week about anger. And we were talking about whether or not it was okay to be angry and how to handle anger and things like that. There's a little peek into my personality. And he said, one of the things that, that finding the source of your anger, one of the ways that you can find the source of your anger is to say, what am I trying to avoid? Usually something you're trying to avoid is what's making you angry. Anger is an important emotion. And here's one of the reasons why it's important. Anger is a, is, exists because the world is not right. And when you see something that's not right, that doesn't line up with how you think things should be, anger rises up. Now, sometimes that's selfish, but oftentimes we get angry because the world is not the way it's supposed to be. Nobody has the best day ever, and then it's like, I am so pumped, I'm going to punch a wall. Nobody does that. Nobody gets a promotion, has a wonderful meal, and then says, you know what? Everything's going great today. I think I'm going to go chew out my kid's soccer coach. Nobody does that. It is only when Something is not right in the world that we feel anger. And this is because that is what God did. God is angry, was angry, is angry because the world is not the way it was created to be. The world is not this perfect place that he designed it to be because sin and evil has broken it. And so in his angry anger, he did something about it. He didn't lash out at us. He didn't slap us around. He sent his son to die for us. He who is perfect in integrity. He who is perfect in purity. Who is perfect in grace. He died for us so that we might live. So that we might not be objects of wrath. But instead be objects of grace. God was angry. And he did something about it. He was angry because the world was not the way it was supposed to be. And so when you are angry, it is a reminder that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. And then grace comes in. And this is what a lot of us forget. We forget the grace component. That one day the world will be as it should be. And so all of our slights, all of our hurts, all of our pains, real or imagined, they'll be consumed by the grace and love of God because of what Jesus has done for us. Because of his death, his burial, and resurrection. One of the reasons why many of us have uncontrolled anger is because we forget the grace. We forget to deal with our anger with grace, recognizing that, yes, the world's not the way it should be. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, because of grace, the world will be set right. 
And so when you speak, when you do something about your anger, do it with grace. Speak with grace. Use grace. Be angry. Do not sin. Be angry and be gracious. Be gracious. It is so important that we speak to one another kindly. It's important that we speak to one another in a life-giving way with integrity, with purity, and above all, with grace. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace that you've given us to speak with one another. God, your words are so important and you've imparted them to us through your, through your Son and through the book that sits in front of us. Lord, I pray that those words would transform us through the power of your Spirit. I pray that our words would be life-giving. I pray that you would begin to remove move the poison of unwholesome talk, the rottenness that's gotten inside of us through the world that we live in. May we set that aside. Lord God, purify us. It's in your Son's name.